So today we're going to start the the, the session the, the under the theme marital duties and causes for divorce, uh, which cover different periods. We'll go through the through the literature. Um, we start with the teshuva by Rav Shiri Ragaon of Iraq. He was one of the geonim, the head of the yeshiva. And here is his teshuva. It's uh, from the material that was discovered in the Geniza. So here's, here's a, a she'ela that uh, was sent to Rav Shira Gaon. And here what he says. Okay, I will translate right away instead of reading the Hebrew. It says, you send a, a question. Uh, a woman who is married, meaning she's under her husband's uh, uh, jurisdiction. That, that's the, the uh, terminology that was used. And she told him, Divorce me, I do not want to live with you. Does, she, does he have to pay her the ketubah or not? Is she called rebellious or not? And we'll get later on to the concept of rebellious. Uh, a rebellious woman was, just briefly, was the, um, uh, discussed in Halakha as a woman who refuses to, uh, to be with her husband. Basically, refuse, denies him marital relationships. Um, and she demands her uh, to get divorced. So it seems from uh, the way he phrased the question that they, those who ask the question accept the, the, uh, the argument of the woman that she needs a divorce. The only question is, should she be, should she be paid the ketubah or not? Because it was understood that the ketubah would not be paid, that's the fine or the deterrent, to prevent her from just initiating a divorce. Um, and he answers this. Uh, we have seen that the halakha, originally was that one is not forced to divorce his wife if she's demanded a divorce, except for those mentioned by the rabbis. There are several exceptions. Some of them, one of them is ta'anat ma'is alai, that, uh, that the husband is engaged in a certain profession or a certain certain thing that, that makes it uh, impossible for the uh, the woman to be with him. Uh, one example is a uh, he became a, a, a tanner, and he works with leather, and he constantly smells of, of uh, processed leather, and she cannot tolerate that, and she wants a divorce. That used to be accepted at the time of the rabbis. Also, if she said that he's impotent, uh, they they trusted her and uh, and would not check it, would not conduct uh, uh, trials to see if it's true or not. And also, if she says that she was uh, she had a, uh, an extramarital affair, and therefore she she. Uh, cannot live with him anymore. In all these cases, they used to trust her. Um, but other, in all other cases, if a woman came in and sort of filed for divorce, that would not have been done. That, that's Shuat din Me'ikara. That's how the halakha was understood originally. But then, when the rabbi here, he mentions Rabbanan Sevurae. Rabbanan Sevurae are those uh, almost anonymous authors who lived between the time of the Talmud and the time of the Geonim, in the bit from about the 5th century to the 7th century, they edited a lot of the Talmud, they added a lot of their material, uh, but they were also uh, masters of halakha. Only they did not produce it under the name of a specific rabbis, but rather as a group. Um, and maybe it was, it's interesting because on one hand it was, um, it was effective because everything they put into the Talmud was accepted I'm not saying if it was good or not, but effective in terms that it worked for them because what they put into the Talmud as a group, as an anonymous group, has been accepted because no one can challenge it. People think that it's part of the original text of the Talmud. But what they wrote as halakha was, uh, if they didn't write it within the framework of the Talmud, could have been challenged because uh, people could could say, we don't know where this comes from. Uh, what they So what they decided, the Rabbanan Savo'e, when they saw that uh, Jewish women go to non-Jewish uh, now this is not clear whether it's non-Jewish men or non-Jewish uh, uh, judicial system probably it's the latter meaning that they turn to the authorities and ask them to force their husbands to give them a get so what happened was that originally the rabbis gave three exceptions three cases where a woman can file for a divorce but no one else could do that. Women needed to get a divorce, so they would turn to the authorities and ask them to force their husbands to to give them the get. 
ויש כותבים גיטים באונס, הוא מסתפק לגט ממוסה שלא כדין. And as a result, some of these divorce documents are written under duress, under the threat of the government, and we are in doubt that maybe this get is uh, as a forced get that did not come, that was not written or given by the, with the free will of the husband, is not legal. Therefore, they made a takana, they made a decree for that, or a regulation, which is, מורדת ותובעת גירושין, שכל נכסי צאן ברזל שהכניסה לו משלה ישלם. וחופין אותו וכותב לה גט לאלתר ויש לה מנה 200. This is an extremely important statement that has been totally abandoned and neglected by, uh, by the halachic authorities today, but very, very, uh, um, very quickly after it's been instituted, maybe quickly I'm saying two, three hundred years. Um, in the time of Maimonides. Maimonides was the one that sort of abolished that. Uh, what is the Takana? When a woman is under this rubric of Moredet, she uh, rebels against her husband, she denies him certain uh, relationships or other things that she, she's supposed to do for him, or if she's Tovad Gerushin, she asks for a divorce, Kol Barzel, she All of the... Uh, uh, all of the possessions, all of the uh, uh, properties that she brought with her, with her, which are called tzon barzel, literally means uh, metal flock. The metal flock or tzon barzel are sort of like real estate, the, and they call tzon barzel because they never lost. So um, they, she brings with him, with her, those properties or those possessions, and as long as they are married, the husband can reap the benefits of those properties, but they all belong to her. So when she gets divorced, he has to give all these things back to her. Not only that, we force him to write a get, and he writes a get immediately, meaning we don't wait, we don't delay to say, let's see if it works for you in a year or two years, uh, and or try to prove her arguments, whether they're right or wrong. But rather, uh, we force him to write her a get immediately, v'yeshla maneu matayim. And depending on what was on what was written in the ketubah, she either gets a mane, which is a hundred coins of gold, or matayim, two hundred go- coins of gold. And that depends on whether her marriage was the first or second marriage. Um, and Rav Shrira concludes, Bazot anu mitnagim ayom ki shana v'yoter. We follow this takana for almost three hundred years. And you also should do this. So Rav Shrira, this is Menachem Elon in his book, uh, Ma'amad Aisha. Uh, Could you please repeat what Maneo Matayim means? I, you broke Maneo Matayim, okay. Maneo Matayim. In the Ketubah, they used to, to specify how much money the woman will get in the case that the Ketubah should be paid to her. So it was either Maneo, which is 100 dinar, uh, 100 coins of gold, or Matayim, 200 dinars, 200 coins of gold. And the difference between one who would get Maneo and one who would get Matayim is whether she, it was her first marriage, a woman who got married for the first time would get matayim, and if she was a widow or a, a divorcee, she would get a hundred. Uh, unless, I mean, that, that is the called ikar ketuba. If she demanded more or the husband wanted to give more, they would have done that. Uh, but that is, when there was no other agreement, that was the basic. Um, now, Menachem Elon adds here, it says, Rav Shreya had this tradition. And according to that tradition, not only... The, there was an acknowledgement of the right of the woman to accept a get when she wants it, but that the decree or the regulation decided that this will be done immediately. And all of the monetary rights of the woman are fully reserved. So Elon adds that Rav Sherira was aware of how important this takana is, and he also mentions in his famous, famous Igeret, Igeret Rav Sherira Gaon, and he wrote that this takana was made in the year... 651 of the common era. So when he writes it, it's almost the turn of the millennium, 651 to 951. Um, and, uh, um, and that is a takana that protects the woman. The, I think the other interesting element here is that the rabbis were forced to make this takana because the women found a way to bypass their authority. So they decided instead of letting the women turn to the uh, non-Jewish authorities, 
651, uh, Elon explains that it's already under the law of Islam. Instead of turning to the Muslim authorities and producing a, uh, a forced get that may not be legal according to Jewish law, we are the ones who are going to force the get, and we are the ones who are going to understand the necessities of the women. So an important development in, in, uh, in the rights of Jewish women. Uh, our next source... Related to that, we're going now to go to Maimonides. It's about 200 years later, after Rav Sheri Ragaon, he lives in the 12th century. Uh, and here, we, we, we'll, go to the, we'll get to the Moredet a little, a little later, but I want to go through the Halachot uh, briefly. That's in the chapter 14 of Ilchot Ishut, uh, of the laws of marriage. He says this, One can marry several women, even a hundred at once. He can marry them simultaneously, and he can marry them one after another. And his wife cannot uh, prevent him from marrying other women. But that depends on his ability to provide food, clothes, and marital relationship as, uh, as deemed appropriate to each and every one of them. And he cannot force them to live in the same house or the same courtyard even. But each one of them uh, can demand to live separately. So um, that is probably part of the balancing act of Maimonides between Talmudic law and what he thought was was correct. So he's not against bigamy or polygamy, but he's, he also understands that it's very difficult. and It's, it's uh, difficult for a man to provide the needs of, of his more than one wife, and it's difficult for the women to accept that, and it's not the right, um, it's not the ideal situation. So he says, if you want to do that, you have to provide for all of them, and they can demand to live in separate uh, courtyards. So one has to be extremely affluent to be able to do that. Um, then he speaks about what um, what are the, uh, uh, what happens when one side, the husband or the wife, tries to force the other one to do something. And he says, "Hamadir et ishto." If one, uh, if he forces her to expose intimate secrets, secrets, or uh, to to do certain things uh, while they're having relationships that she considers uh, disgraceful, she could force him to give him a get. Meaning, he has to. She could initiate a divorce, and she will be paid the amount of the ketubah. If one in halacha, we read this. Chapter 14, Halakha If one denies his wife marital relationships uh, one week, sorry, Shabbat HaChad Mabtinino, we wait for him one week. So he's given a, if he stops doing it deliberately, she could say, she could come to Bedin and say, this is what is happening. They will give him one week ultimatum. And if he does not change it, she could get a divorce. Or if it was a nether, if it's a vow, we help him uh, annul the vow. In number seven, we read that uh, uh, a man cannot do that, cannot deny his wife marital relationships. And if he did it in order to uh, to tease her or to cause her uh, suffering, he has transgressed a, the prohibition of the Torah. And if he became ill or he is weak and he cannot have relationships, he is given six months to recover. And then if he didn't recover... Either she has to uh, forgive her rights, meaning she loves him and she wants to be with him, she doesn't care about what, what he can or cannot do. Uh, but if she doesn't, if she, she insists on, um, on her right and that, or, or she wants an intimate relationship, she, he, she could force him to divorce her and to give her a ketubah. Now, <clears throat> there's something similar when it comes from her side. But interestingly enough, um, whereas we speak when we speak about the men, we say it's forbidden and he transgressed the lot but then we give him some leeway. Um, here's how we speak about the woman. A woman who denied her husband, who denies her husband marital relationships, is called rebellious. The bed, the, so he comes to Bedin, he complains that my wife rebelled against me. But we ask her, why are you rebelling? If she says, I hate him, or I, he's repugnant, and um, and I cannot be with him willingly. Or in other words, when he says I cannot be 
uh, with him consensually. She says that being with him is almost like rape, it's a violation. Uh, we force him to divorce her immediately. Why? She's not a captive uh, of war to be uh, to have a relation with one that she doesn't uh, that she cannot tolerate. But she is divorced. This is not what Rav Shari Ragaon said. Rav Shari Ragaon said that she's being paid the full amount of the ketubah. Rambam says she does not get the ketubah. And what she can get, whatever clothes she brought with her, and belaot means uh, worn out garments. So now there's a called belaot. Uh, they're not... They're not new, they're not in mint condition, but everything that she has left from what she brought with her, she could uh, she could take uh, with her, but she doesn't take anything that belongs to the husband. Even if he bought her shoes or a scarf, he has to take off, she has to take it off and give it back to him, and any gift he gave her, she has to give back, because he didn't give her those gifts for her to take and go, which is... Uh, a little, not a little. Bit, it's harsh. You know, you could have said that there is a certain balance that uh, she has. She could take it with her the bare necessities. When you say that, even the shoes on her feet and 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 the scarves. Remember that Rambam uh, speaks with the with the with the, uh, the mentality and the reality <coughs> of wom- women not having their own account and everything that they own is bought by the husband. So that even though he says that when she files for a divorce, she will get it, but she doesn't get anything, she doesn't get any benefits, she doesn't get ketubah, and she might lose everything she owns because everything was bought by the husband. Unless she gets married, she wants a divorce a month after the, at the wedding when most of her stuff is still, uh, is still there. So uh, it's a legislation that is meant... To prevent women from uh, uh, from being able to fight for a divorce, now what happens if she did uh, this kind of rebellion in order to uh, to tease him, to annoy him, and why is that? She says, "I'm I'm tormenting him with that because he did other things to me, or because he cursed me, or because he fought with me." So, what would you say now? You should say that it's still it's not. Uh, the the hatred or the or the repugnance that is mentioned in the previous uh, halacha is about physical uh, physical problems. Here, she doesn't she cannot tolerate him because of his behavior or because of of the way he talks. Yet Rambam says, my money says, you send her a message from Bedin and you tell her, you should know that if you uh, if you uh, continue. If you insist on your rebellion, even if your ketubah is a hundred money, which is uh, 10,000 uh, 10, golden coins, or a hundred times the ketubah uh, of, uh, of someone who got married the second time, 50 times the ketubah of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of one who got married the first marriage. So she might have a, a, a very uh, hefty ketubah, and, then she, and they tell her, you're going to lose all of it. And then, after that, if she refused to change her mind, they announce, they announce the, the, the story publicly in all the synagogues, in all the study halls in town, every day, for four weeks. So, uh, they, uh, they tell her, you're going to lose everything, and she's being publicly shamed in all the synagogues and study halls in town for a whole month. How probable is it with this kind of legislation for a woman to file for a divorce when she knows this is what they're going to do to her? And then, it's not over, uh, in Halakha 10, he says, after this announcement was done for four weeks, she's being informed a second time, and she's told, if you're still re- uh, rebellious, if you're still insisting in... Uh, in rebelling against your husband, you lost your ketubah. Uh, if uh, if she keeps on 
uh, if she's still stubborn, Nimlachin, but they tell her this is what's going to happen, and she loses the ketubah, but Enot Nimlaget at Shnei Masar Chodesh. She doesn't get the divorce until 12 months have passed. Ve'en la mezonot kol shnei masar chodesh. And during those 12 months, she has no alimony. And if she dies before getting the get, the husband inherits all of her real estate properties that she bought with her. Um, so, so far what we see is this, that Rav Sheira Gon speaks of a takana that... that, that understands the woman, and, you know, it, I said before that the rabbis uh, had to do it because the women bypassed them. and But the fact that the women bypassed the rabbis could have sent two different messages to the rabbis. Maybe they understand, understood both of them. One message was, we're going to do it no matter what, so you better do it right. Um... And and that's where the sort of the legal question comes in: Is it kosher or not? So we better do it kosher. The second message was: We really need it. We we are so desperate that we need that divorce that we will, we will we're willing to do whatever it takes to get it done. So, and that is probably what Rav Sharira uh, or the 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 Sevuraim understood. They said this: They are signaling to us that it is a problem. And I think we spoke about that in in other classes or in, in, when discussing the development of halakha. When the rabbis realize that there is a problem, they will find a solution. But the question is, can you bring them to see that there is a problem? Now, Maimonides makes it uh, extremely difficult for a woman to file for a divorce. Um, first of all, she's called a moredet. The, the husband, when the husband refuses sex to his, to his wife, he's called a transgressor, and he is not allowed to do that. But she is a rebellious. She's she's a rebel. She's a uh, meaning she's not part of society because rebelling is breaking the norms of society. Um, then the the consequences are she's going to lose everything. She's going to lose the ketubah. Only real estate that's still there she could get, but it, all of her possessions, everything that he gave her, then she's publicly shamed. You know, pu- public shaming is not an invention of Facebook. It existed back then. Uh, and the, so they publicly shame her for a whole month. How would you like to go around town knowing that in every synagogue your name is mentioned, this is the rebellious woman? Nobody wants that. And then they tell her again, you're going to lose the ketubah. She loses it. But now she gets into a, an economic limbo. She's, not, she's still married to her husband. She probably, uh, she's not allowed to be with him because that's the mered is a mered. She's uh, declared a moreded. So she cannot be with him, but she does not have uh, her ketubah either. So she's not paid. She doesn't get alimony for 12 months. How is she going to live? Who is going to sustain her? Unless she kept money aside or she has friends who are going to sustain her, she's going to be in the streets. And on top of that, if she died before she got the divorce, if she died within the year, all of her possessions are inherited by that hateful husband. That's difficult. And he goes to al Khayyad Gimel, Amuredat Azot, this rebellious woman, I think I feel like some negative, uh, or maybe it means Amuredat Azot, one that she met all the requirements, that's Amuredat Azot. When she leaves after 12 months, she returns everything that belongs to the husband. But what she brought in, Uvlauten Kayamim, im tafsa en motzin miyada. Now, even those things that my Maimonides said should go back with her, it's only if she has control over them. But if the husband grabbed them, which could be even could even happen with real estate, if he's a squatter, that she has an apartment that she she brought into the marriage, and he lived there, or he has tenants there now, or he sold it uh, without her permission, in certain cases... It belongs to him because he's tofes. So she has very little control over what she is going to get. Uh, and also, if... Uh, this is an important line also, to see how, how difficult they made it for her. The means that when, when they get married and she brings some possession with her, the husband is allowed to handle these possessions. 
these properties, but he is responsible for losses. So uh, if there are gains, he receives the gains, but he always has to give her back the capital. If the capital lost its value, it's his responsibility to make up for it. But if she's a rebellious woman, she doesn't get that. It says, I'm following here the law of the Talmud. The Geonim said that they have different minhagim. Uh, and that's one of the rare cases that Maimonides mentions another opinion. Maimonides is usually monolithic. There's only one opinion. Is that the only one that he mentions? He doesn't. Uh, he doesn't like to mention other possibilities. But this is a crucial uh, matter, and he has to quote Rav Sheri Ragaon, who says that they have this mean when they, he says Yeshlaim Bebavel. Remember, we saw that Rav Sheri Ra says we have this rule for over three hundred years. It's not. It's not a simple thing, but. My mother says, "Velo pashtu otama minagot berov Israel," but these uh, customs or practices are not widespread among most of the communities. Verabim ugdolim holkim naleim berov amikomot, and many great scholars contest them; they disagree with them. Uvedina Talmud raui litpos v'ladun, and we should follow the law of the Talmud. So. The the interesting uh, thing about Maimonides' statement is that up until shortly before his time, up until the 11, uh, 1100s, Rambam was born uh, 1138 and died 1204. So up until the 1100s, the, the late uh, 1100s, uh, um, the... Uh, the rule of the Goni was still accepted in most of Sephardic, most of the of the the Jewish world, especially the Sephardic or what we called the uh, in the Muslim world in Spain, in North Africa, in Iraq, <clears throat> and they were Rova Mekomot. He doesn't he doesn't show he doesn't say what is he relying on when he says that those minhagim were not widespread. Maybe there were not so many cases, but in those cases you have to. Uh, to do the statistics and see how many times this minhag has been followed, more uh, so, more probable, more probably, this is or his own decision. He decided that this is not a widespread minhag. This, by the way, goes back to his introduction to the to the to Mishneh Torah, that is worth studying in depth. I have a series of the, where this is discussed in the series of Semicha, um, where he restructured. The, the the power hierarchy from the Geonim down to his time to give him him and other rabbis of the time an equal footing uh, vis-a-vis the Geonim. So he could argue with them and reject their words, even though in general he says you cannot contest the, the words of a, of a greater scholar of the previous generation. So whatever uh, victory was achieved by the women in Iraq from the 6th to the 9th century has now been destroyed by Maimonides. Um, you know, he just sounds... So, let, let's go a little bit more with the laws of marriage here. Um, he says in uh, the laws of marriage, chapter 15, that a woman is allowed to tell her, is allowed to, uh, if she agrees with her husband not to have sex, she's allowed to do that. Meaning, if she's if if he asks her for that and she's willing to for them both to be abstinent, it's okay. But uh, that is only if he has no children. Uh, I mean, sorry, if he already have children, and he fulfilled, he has fulfilled his obligation to be fruitful and multiply. Which male, remember, male children. No, banim. He means according to halacha, it's a boy and a girl. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but if he did not do it, he has to have sexual relation with with her at every time uh, that it is possible until he has children because it's a mitzvah midoraita. In Halakha Bet, he says, the man is commanded to have, uh, to be fruitful and multiply, but not the woman. And that is, that is not his invention. That's based on the rabbinical interpretation of purvu, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, where do they take it from? How can they limit it to the men only and not to the woman? 
since it's impossible to have children without the uh, participation of the woman, uh, ironically. Right? So they took it from the, the end of the Pasuk, in, in Bereshit it says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the land, and, and conquer it. So the rabbi said, men conquer, women do not conquer. Therefore, the commandment is not directed to women. So uh, they wrote her off the obligation of having children, and uh, it's, 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 uh, um, it doesn't really help her, because first it, it makes her to not do a mitzvah when she has children, where that man does have a mitzvah, without working hard. And uh, they also uh, denied her the credit of being the creator of life. She's not the one who creates life. She's not the one who carries the children in her womb and, and, and uh, uh, is willing to suffer for them at pregnancy and at birth and, and raising them up and all that. She becomes only this passive tool that enables the husband to fulfill his obligation. So that's very, uh, I think, it's unfortunate and, and something that has to be changed in the mentality of the uh, of the Orthodox world. Um, the uh, uh, and then, by the way, this is also uh, something that we, you see later on in midrashic literature. Um, I wrote once in an article about Parashat uh, Shemot. We know what the rabbis say that regarding the book of Shemot. That Bnei Israel were redeemed from Egypt because of the merit of the righteous women. So the the original midrash was was uh, sensitive and understood the role of women. They, the, whoever said that stem over the midrash understood that Yocheved and Miriam and the daughter of Pharaoh and Shifra and Pua were all great women who were able to stand up to the tyrant, and they brought up Moshe, and they raised him and educated him. But later on, the Midrash took it to a completely different direction. They they spoke about uh, uh, the women coming to the field, to their husband, tempting them, enticing them, having children with them, you know, uh, uh, being pregnant with six kids at a time. So, uh, again, they gave them this passive role. They are just the tool for the men to accomplish their mission. So I wrote this article as an interview with Yocheved for the radio of the desert of the time where she complains about the, how the, how those stories turned her into a baby popping machine uh, instead of being, you know, the courageous woman that she was. So that is a problem. Anyway, this is, well, this is what Rambam says here about based on the Halakha and the Talmud. And um, we, will, we will stop here and continue with... Uh, uh, Halakha bet from sorry, halakha uh, het where we speak about the the cases of infertility.